on the screen, whether you've been to church before or not, if you watched a Charlie Brown Christmas special, you've heard these words. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger, and suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. You know, we've heard those words all different kinds of ways. And hard to believe that we're already in Christmas season. I, I'm I, like with the weather, the way it's been the last couple days, doesn't feel like we're headed toward Christmas at all. Dinah and I were in New York last weekend and then I was in Nashville this week and everywhere you go, it's got Christmas. And last night uh, and Friday night here, you guys did the big Christmas thing and it was awesome and lots of people and lots of festivities. And truth be told, I'm actually not ready for it to be Christmas yet. Like it should be like a month or two away, and here we are just a few weeks away. And we want to kick a series off. Uh, the next three weeks, we want to be talking about this, Christmas peace. The angels announced to those terrified shepherds that night that they were going to have peace, that there would be peace. And yet, it doesn't seem like much peace, is there? And we want to talk about three things, peace with our pain. We're going to talk about that today. Lots of pain in the world, some of it personal. Peace with others because that's not always easy for us. And then what does it mean for us to have peace with God? And so in the next couple of weeks, we wanna just look at this idea of Christmas peace. Let me just pray, ask God to invite, uh, for us to invite God into the middle of the things we have going on. Let's pray together. Father, I'm grateful for uh, the opportunity we have to gather today. And Lord, I pray that uh, we would find your peace. That, Lord, as we uh, come in this place, we come with different stuff going on in our lives, different challenges, different stresses, different uh, frustrations and disappointments and heartaches, and we gather in this place, and, Lord, we invite you to meet us in the middle of our own pain. We are grateful, Father, for you, and we want to lift you up. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, that song that we sang just uh, as we were headed here, Silent Night, that's a that's a... A wonderful song, and if you don't know the story behind Silent Night, look it up today uh, on your way home. It's a great story about a, a parish priest in what is now Austria, uh, a German uh, priest, and, and um, uh, a, a schoolmaster, Franz Gruber, who put together this song, and uh, they sang it on a Christmas Eve service, and then a traveling group of singers picked it up from there, and it's become one of the most popular uh, Christmas carols that we sing. Everybody knows Silent Night, except that night was not anything but silent. First of all, the shepherds are out doing their thing. Here, sheepy, sheepy, I don't know exactly what the shepherds were doing, but they're out taking care of the sheep. And then this angel uh, shows up, and, and like, boom, right there in the night sky, and makes this big announcement, and, 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 and that would put some fruit in your looms if you're out in the middle taking care of some sheep. Some of you are going to ask what that was about. You can't after the service. And they were afraid, they were terrified. 
And, and, and there wasn't any peace that night for them. And, and they hear about this baby being born and then they rush off to see it and, and the story unfolds. And we're gonna kind of track with this story and talk about the peace that comes. But is there peace? Because one of the things, here's what I know about the Christmas season. I've been doing the people thing for a long time and here's what I know. For some of you, well, life is going good and it's wonderful and Christmas magnifies that. It just makes it like everything else is good. The food is good. The sights are good. Everything is good. Hey, it's just wonderful. Like you just can't wait. Your, it, your world is going good and Christmas makes it even bigger. And for some of you, your world is difficult. This year's brought some challenges to you. You've got some stuff going on. And it could be one of a thousand different things or a thousand things going on in our lives. And guess what? Christmas magnifies that as well. Makes it even bigger. The, the heartache we feel, the loneliness we feel, the pain we're feeling, it gets bigger as well. When I hear the song, Silent Night, it takes me back a lot of years. We're in a church auditorium just about like this one. Packed out. Friends and family are gathered. My mom and I are, and dad are, are down here in the front row. And there's a casket up front. Just a week before Christmas. My sister, who was 18, had been killed in an accident with a drunk driver. And our family gathered. Her favorite song was Silent Night. So guess what we sang? And so for me, even today, all these years later, if I'm driving down the road and I hear the Christmas carol on, or we're in a service somewhere, and I hear that song, I fly right back to a funeral service. For some of you, this has been a hard year. Not a lot of peace. Difficulties come in our lives in a lot of different ways. And so Christmas is a bit of a mixed bag for you. Wonderful on the one hand because of all the memories and feelings and yet the pain point you're feeling gets exaggerated for us. Jesus said these words. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. But feeling troubled and fear are seemingly in plenty of commodity for us, aren't they? I mean, right now, just why, why do we get troubled? Why is there fear? Even in this Christmas season that's supposed to be about peace and joy and happiness and love and, well, you know, there's a, a new version of COVID out there that's coming our direction and we don't know what to think about that and the supply chain has issues going on and the economy seems a bit bumpy and, and that's just the global stuff. And then it boils down into our world and We've had some loss or disappointment, and for you this year has been a hard year. Not much peace. Life happens, and sometimes it happens to us, and for some of you, it happened to you this year. You lost a loved one, maybe you lost a job, got some financial trouble, a relationship coming apart, trouble with kids, with parents, with friends, with family. We grieve and our hearts break, and those things shake our soul. They disrupt us. And then we get troubled because of the woulda, coulda, shoulda's in our lives, right? Those things that, that, that we know we could have done, should have done, didn't do. All the regrets and disappointments and heartaches, they get magnified at Christmas, don't they? Because we're reminded again that, that some stuff didn't happen for us. We were in New York with our uh, granddaughter over last weekend, and, and uh, we, we, we do this thing uh, when, uh, when we've only done it once, it's now our second time, when one of our grandkids turns 10, 
uh, we, they plan a trip and we take them where they want to go. And she wanted to go to New York and, and uh, we love New York. And so we went and we were in Times Square and I was showing her where the ball drops, you know, and all that. And we went to Rockefeller Center and skated. We did all the tourist stuff that I never do when I'm in New York. I'll be in New York again this week and I won't do any of that tourist stuff. We had a great time with her. It was an awesome time. We get to bless her and speak into her life and give her a verse that we think describes her. And can I just share like a really fuzzy, this has nothing to do with the message, warm uh, uh, family moment. So we were, we were at uh, one of Diane's favorite restaurants in Central Park and, and uh, we'd take it and Bria's there and we're having dinner and we spoke to her that and we just said, here's the things we love about you and appreciate you and admire in you. Here's what we think God's doing in your heart and your life. And so we got to do that moment with her, and we got all done, and she said, well, can I tell you what I love about you? Man, I was like a puddle at that point, so I had nothing to do with the message, but it was a nice story. <laughs> but we're in Times Square, and there's the place where the ball drops, you know, and, and I was telling her how that worked and what they do there. You know why they drop the ball in Times Square on New Year's Eve? You know why they do that? It's to remind you of all the ways you dropped the ball this past year. You know, all those woulda, coulda, shoulda stuff in your life, all those things that you didn't do, they create some trouble for us, don't they? They create some pain for us. And then there's the things that we've talked ourselves out of. How many of you can sing? <laughs> Two of you? How many of you can dance, right? Do you know what, if I go down just across the hallway to those kids down there, and I go in that room and say, how many of you can sing? They all raise their hand. How many of you can dance? They all raise their hand. But you know what? Life's happened to you, and you know you can't sing or dance, right? <laughs> the truth is, there's a lot of stuff, and some of that stuff is painful to us. The writer of Hebrews says this to us, Therefore, since we have such a great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance, those weighty things, those things that impede your journey and the sin that so easily entangles you because sin does that doesn't it and here's what I know when we gather together like this we're a we're a we're a room of colossal moral failure because this week some of you gossiped and some of you lied and some of your pride got in the way and sometimes lust gets the best of us and our greed gets in and man we screw up and some of that stuff creates some pain some of the pain in our lives is at the hands of others. Somebody made a choice and it messed with our heart. Some of our pain is our own doing. Our choices created stuff. Most of our pain is a mix of those things. Some of our pain happens because life happens. Not much peace. David spoke these words in the Psalms. Why are you so downcast, my soul? Why so disturbed within me? I don't know how Christmas is going to play out for any of us, and I don't know how it's going to play out for you. If things are good, Christmas will magnify that. If there's some pain this Christmas, that will get magnified as well. And David says this, so put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. Now when we say the word hope, we, we, don't, we often use it as a wish. I hope this happens. I hope that happens. I hope the Broncos win tonight. They're playing the Chiefs. Uh, I hope I get good news from the doctor. I hope that that bonus comes through this Christmas. I, and it's kind of wishful thinking. The word hope in the Bible is interesting. First of all, the Hebrew word for hope, we didn't even see till we're a long ways in to the Old Testament. It's the book of Ruth where it shows up the first time for us. Over 270 times we get the word hope. And the Old Testament word for hope is linked to the word very closely. It's parallel that means trust. So what David is saying isn't just put your wishful thinking, put your hope that this might happen. He's saying put your trust in God. Put your trust in God. The word in the New Testament is the word alpha, and it means this. It means to, to, to have this confident expectation, to anticipate or expect that something is going to happen. And it actually means with pleasure. It means you're looking forward to this thing occurring. I don't know what you're looking forward to, but the Bible invites me to look forward to what God is doing to what he can do. Hebrews says it this way. Now faith is being sure of what we 
hope for and certain of what we do not see. A lot of us put our hope in this Christmas season and that somehow gathering with family will be the thing that eases our, our heartache or disappointment or that gift that's going to come or that the music and the festivities and the lights and all the specials. And those are all good things. There's actually a lot of that stuff about the Christmas season that can be fun and enjoyable, heartwarming and fill us. But it does not meet the deepest part of my heart. It does not fill the empty spot in my soul. It numbs it, it, it helps me avoid it, it helps me get by it, but the reality is a lot of us wake up the day after Christmas and the same old, same old we've been feeling is still there. What the Bible invites us to is a hope that we put our trust in. That first Christmas was anything but peaceful. We sing silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Man, there was political chaos. Caesar had ordered a census. The reason for a census was twofold. They're getting ready to march on to war into somebody else's territory again, and they wanted to make sure they had enough cash to pay for it. And they needed to know where you were. And you know what they did? They sent you to your hometown. Can you imagine right now, if to do a census, you had to go to your hometown? In fact, on the count of three, just say your hometown. One, two, three. Yeah, that's chaotic right there. Who wants to go there? You know, the reality was, and now you got this young couple, and they get there, and place is crowded, and they get birthed out in a barn, you know. Mary's out there, got no help. Joseph, like, that's helpful. And, and then... <laughs> And then the Bible tells us some wise men show up, and we have the nice little nativity scene where they're all there at the birth. They, they showed up. They were two years late. They weren't wise, right? And look, and, and we know they were men, not women, because what they, what'd they bring? They didn't bring, like, pampers and baby food. And other, you know, they came with, like, gold and myrrh and stuff. Like, that's going to help. Man, that first Christmas was a mess. And this Christmas might be messy for you. So what do we do with the Christmas? The Bible invites me to put my hope in that which can be trusted. The God who said he would bring peace. Remember what Jesus said, I'm bringing you peace, but not like the world brings. Something that goes deeper for us. Paul said it this way, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. At LifeBridge, we did a thing every year um, called Blue Christmas. We would do it normally like this weekend. Um, as we recognize this, that for some of you, this is a blue Christmas. Some kind of loss in your life, whatever that is, has created angst and heartache and disappointment. And this is just going to be a tough season. Because sometimes life is tough. And pain happens. And in the midst of the Christmas season, I want to encourage you, don't put your hope in all the stuff. All the traditions that can be good, all the holiday season things that can be fun, all the wishful thinking of stuff we hope happens or doesn't happen. That first Christmas, God delivered on his promise, and he'll deliver it on it again this Christmas. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. For some, Christmas will be hard. But God is inviting every one of us to be real people with real faith in a real world. And that real world has disappointment. And anybody who's promised you that a relationship with God will make your life all warm and fuzzy and you live in a bubble and there won't be any hard or disappointment, man, they were lying to you. Because Jesus said, you're going to have some trouble in the world. But take heart, I've overcome the world.
Put your hope in God. So I have a lot of great Christmas memories. I'm sure you do. And I have one that's probably one of my best Christmas memories, but honestly, it's flipped on its head in how it happened. I remember uh, growing up, my parents would uh, load my sister and I up in the back of our car and we would drive uh, <clears throat> into Syracuse and drop off gifts at the relatives. And uh, um, I, I remember we couldn't wait to get to my Aunt uh, Pearl's and Uncle Johnny's because uh, uh, Polish descent, and we'd have all this phenomenal food and there was a Christmas Eve party and it was pierogies and glumkies and all that stuff that you have. And, and then, and then you, if you grow up in upstate New York, you think you're Italian and Catholic whether you are or you aren't. And, and, uh, and then there was all the Italian food that would come with that, which I believe is the best food on the planet. And, and, uh, and then we would load back up in the car. In Syracuse, it was always snowing, you seem like, and, and cold. And we'd turn on WSYR, and we'd track where Santa was, and we'd head to our house. And I have a lot of great Christmas memories around that. But Christmas of 1979 was uh, a year after my sister had been killed in that car accident. And uh, that Christmas was... The first Christmas without her was just a blur. It was just a few days before Christmas. We were pretty numb. The next Christmas was dark. We got home from my Aunt Pearl's, my Uncle Johnny's. I was a sophomore in college. And uh, um, sat around our house. It was a little tree. We put the tree up. And it was a tough time, especially for my mom and dad. Next morning, uh, we get up, and I'm, uh, I come down in the kitchen. It was early in the morning, and my dad was sitting at the kitchen table. And I said, what are we going to do today? And he said, you know what I want to do right now is I'd like to drive out to the cemetery. Well, we were having one of those upstate New York snowstorms, and it was just pretty much a whiteout. But I said to my dad, we should go. We shoveled the driveway out, got in the car, made our way out a few miles to that cemetery. Couldn't drive back in because the snow was too deep. Parked on the side of the road. We walked back pretty far to where my sister's grave was. My dad and I hadn't spoken to each other the entire ride over, really. Nothing to say. Lost in her own thoughts. We got out to her gravesite. My dad had gotten down on his hands and knees and started brushing away snow around her stone. We did that. But then he started digging around in front of her grave. And I didn't realize it, but he had planted a little evergreen tree earlier that summer on her grave. He was digging all the snow away from it. Then he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a little stained glass ornament. It was Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus in the manger. And my dad hung that on the tree. And then he said, would you pray? Neither one of us had been Christians very long. But grateful for the hope we found in that moment. On the stone that marks my sister's grave are these words, grieve not for me, nor let one small tear fall. For what you can only dream, I can see. And friends, that's worth it all. It's worth it all. And for just a moment, all the wind and snow seemed like it had stopped swirling. And for just a moment, there was Christmas peace in the midst of one of our family's deepest heartbreaks. Because God delivers on his promise that there can be peace. Let's pray.